Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, having us here to share uh, some work that we've been doing at the University of Canberra around um, open access and uh, open academia uh, that we'd like to share with you and, and get your uh, response to. The notes and the slides for this presentation are all available on the web from tinyurl.com slash openkca, so you can follow things up. Uh, Lee Blackall is, uh, we're both in the Faculty of Health. Lee uh, works in sport and he works as the Learning uh, Commons Coordinator. And myself, I uh, teach in the uh, Centre for Applied Psychology. So we're very much at the coalface, but what we've been doing is trying to um, extract some of the general principles from our work at the coalface and then working back up um, the university hierarchy to have discussions about uh, how we can adapt policy and practice to embrace the opportunities that are now on the horizon around um, uh, open, open licensing of, of academic materials. So our presentation is in the public domain, so you're free to grab any of this and, and reuse it elsewhere. Uh, we want to acknowledge that we, we've been invited to talk here on behalf of uh, the University of Canberra's Office of Development and Engagement, and uh, we've got a third colleague here, Lewis, um, with us as well. Okay, so I'll um, take 10 minutes or so just to offer you some of the philosophical thinking and principles behind this uh, kind of paradigm-shifting notion of, of open academia. Uh, we'll give you a couple of examples of what it might look like in practice, and then Lee's going to talk to you about uh, the initiatives that we've got uh, at the University of Canberra in terms of engaging and networking and um, uh, getting the university and our colleagues on board with uh, the proposals. So a little bit of, uh, I guess, going back to think about what a university is, what it's here for, and what kind of role it plays in our culture and society. And if you go and look at most universities' mission statements, they're not that different from one another, by and large. And they more or less coalesce around the idea that a university is here to serve a function in society, and ultimately it's to create and develop knowledge, and then to disseminate and share that knowledge with society. Now for us, we're going to talk about these uh, princ some principles, but being, making sure that these are applicable at the coalface is just as important. Uh, and so we want to try and talk to you about how some of the problems and um, practices of putting this into application. One of our starting points is to acknowledge and recognise that the vast majority of content and knowledge that we work with at universities is underutilised and it's not it's rarely ever seen to um, commercial application, much as um, Scott's graphs just showed. So we're as interested, I guess, in capitalising on the uncommercialisable content, at least in a traditional sense, by saying rather than lock it up and uh, hide it away, what would happen to a university and what would happen to a society if we unlocked that material and made it uh, much more readily available? and that this may represent um, a way for universities to have a deeper level of dynamic engagement with its, uh, with its community. Uh, what we're suggesting we're, is also that by uh, opening up materials and intellectual capital at universities, that we will also contribute to that small amount of knowledge that does get commercialised, because the university and the community will get to know what knowledge the university has much more readily. At the moment, it's in dusty folders and personal hard drives and so on. If we could see more of it and access more of it and network with more of it, then it will contribute to that frisson of ideas, some of which can then bubble uh, up to, to have um, commercial application. So we see our role as academics um, as being part of a collaborative knowledge commons, building that commons, uh, and sharing and disseminating uh, that knowledge commons. This is a, we see this as a reciprocal relationship. So the taxpayer for public funded institutions 
uh, provides the resources, the infrastructure and the operating costs for a university and in return the university's role is to share back its discoveries and its knowledge and offer training um, and ways to, ways to access and, and uh, that knowledge. And we see that public funded universities in particular of all places should actually be championing, championing this knowledge sharing and um, uh, access to scholarly, scholarly resources, much as we expect of a library or our public uh, service sector, uh, public universities should also be out there um, contributing significantly to this. So our approach then is coming, I guess, from the philosophical position of how do we maximise sharing and access to, uh, to knowledge, as opposed to what we would probably argue is the normative practice within universities which is to minimise sharing and to meter it out very slowly. If you pay for a course, we will give you hard copies of materials and we'll restrict everything else as much as possible and so on. So we're inviting you to entertain the idea of what would a university look like that took on uh, this kind of approach. So it really comes down to this dilemma that you're all facing every day um, and that is for any particular piece of content how do you negotiate and decide uh, whether to share or protect that material uh, and whether to promote it out into the world or restrict access to it? The proposal that we're going to put to you, and Lee's going to expand on this, is uh, a conversation that's being had by many governments at the moment, and that is that perhaps for those institutions and services that are fundamentally public funded, we flip the switch from the default being closed to the default being open. And then if we do want to restrict something and close it off, that's okay, but we want to have a particular reason for doing that, and otherwise we would make the information uh, as accessible and open as possible. So let's now have a look at how We've been approaching um, these kinds of ideas in practice. We're starting with this idea that openness represents a, a theoretical component to authentic scholarship, authentic scientific uh, scholarship. And indeed, openness is pretty key to that. If you submit an article to a journal, the idea is that it gets peer reviewed and then gets put out for, for public consultation, that data should be verifiable, um, that there's been due process and um, ethics in, in the research process, etc. So this principle seems to be very much inherent in actually what constitutes uh, scholarship as opposed to um, you know, private opinion. The philosophy is really quite simple but in practice it gets kind of gnarly and complicated and that's probably why many of us um, do the jobs that we do. At any point then there is that decision whether you're the knowledge creator or whether you come into possession of intellectual property to effectively turn left or right. Now there are shades of grey in between but fundamentally it comes down to is your attitude uh, to the knowledge to go down the closed, restricted path or the open path. Normative practice in universities is largely um, closed. So we have, um, to various extents, uh, restricted access of materials, restricted copyright licences. Uh, we tend to use proprietary formats for, for, for our digital files, or as you'll notice now, many governments are switching over to open formats for their files. Uh, and that's linked with then requiring proprietary software to access um, those archives and, and, and files. And fifthly up there, um, the governance processes involved in how the knowledge is managed is often somewhat uh, opaque. In taking the journey towards open academia, then we can turn each of these things around and suggest that these might be some some pillars or principles that, that we need to think about and apply. Uh, so our digital files being stored in op open formats that can be accessed with, with open source software, openly licensed materials unless there's a particularly 
good commercial reason or ethical reason uh, to close them off, having transparent governance, making the materials openly accessible uh, such that you can use um, free software to, to access those files. So a couple of examples of what this might look like uh, on the ground. Um, this is an important announcement, if you're not aware of it, that the Australian Federal Government, as of last month, uh, took on the recommendations of the Government 2.0 Task Force. And within that, the Federal Government has flipped the switch on public service information. And the IP policy now states that um, public sector information should be licensed under the Creative Commons uh, by standard as the default. And that goes on to say, you know, if, if you don't want to license it or there's a reason not to, then you go through a, a uh, negotiation process around the license to be applied. Uh, now, the Australian government is not the first. New Zealand has gone and um, several of the European countries uh, have already gone this way or are heading this way. So if that's the signal coming from our federal government, you'll notice that the funding grant bodies are increasingly requiring um, data to be openly available once you've done your grant and that your materials that are disseminated to be in, in the public domain, then uh, I guess it invites the universities to think about how they're going to respond uh, accordingly. Um, one of the examples that we probably have all somewhat familiar with is um, the journals and the textbooks that we use in, in teaching. So a typic typically what happens is that the public will fund universities to do research to write articles. Uh, we then give away the rights generally to a proprietary journal and the member of the public must then pay again to access that article. And as a member of the public who's paid your taxes for the universities to do the research, you might be left thinking, uh, what did I get out of that um, when it's so difficult to get access to the information? Uh, so increasingly the open journals and the internet are becoming an alternative and many academics will submit to the journal and then try and renegotiate the rights so that they can put it up on, on the internet. There's no particular reason why the knowledge shouldn't be uh, available to the public. Textbook prices um, have doubled uh, in relation to inflation over the past couple of decades. Uh, in the course that I taught this semester, we couldn't find an appropriate textbook. There wasn't an Australian uh, textbook and it wasn't uh, covering the topic.